Bienvenue chez Jean-Michel Grosjeu. Welcome back to the second video in my series about the full rule set of Magic Realm, the timeless landmark of fantasy gaming and simply one of the best games ever. After watching my first video, you know how to move your character, how to search for treasure locations and how to loot them. And yes, the Magic Realm could be a wonderful world of plenty, but it seems that unfortunately you are not alone. And so my second video will be devoted to monsters. Where they are, when you will meet their teeth and claws and how you will deal with them. At the beginning of the game, all the monsters of the Magic Realm are resting on the setup card. Imagine they are lurking in the depth of the woods or the caves, not aware yet that you, the adventurers, are walking on their grounds. But if you pay attention, you can perhaps spot some clues to their presence. These clues take the form of cheats, yellow and red cheats. These cheats are laid face down on tiles. As we already know from video number one, when a character ends his daylight phase, any face down cheat on his tile is flipped face up. The adventurer entering the caves sees some old bones on the floor and hears what sounds like a distant howl. Red cheats bear a number, so they are immediately put in the corresponding clearing. Yellow cheats, having no number, stay where they are, in the wild, out of any clearing. These cheats are clues that perhaps monsters may be lurking very close. Now, what makes monsters actually appear on the map is the monster roll. The monster roll happens at sunrise. Sunrise is a game phase wedged between birdsong and daylight. Any player rolls one die, just one, and a special monster roll token is put on the setup card to show what will be the active row for the day. Here, with a roll of four, the active row will be the fourth. That means that for the whole day, only monsters on this row can spawn on the map. Then, at daylight, after his activities, our character flips all cheats on his tile, and then he checks on the setup card's active row if any monster is summoned. Look, the setup card gives what cheats can summon monsters in this current row. And we find the words Bone C, the same words as on the yellow cheat. That means that the yellow cheat actually summons the first stack of monsters under the Bone C entry to heavy trolls. There are two monster boxes under this entry, but on one given turn, one cheat can only summon one box of monsters. Here, that means two monsters because this box holds two heavy trolls. You can see also that there is a no hole entry on this row. That means that no monster is summoned by the red cheat. If monsters are summoned by a red cheat, they go directly to this red cheat's clearing. But here, the two trolls are summoned by a yellow cheat. And yellow cheats don't stand on a clearing because they have no number. So monsters summoned by yellow cheat go to the clearing of the character that triggered their summoning. This is the first lesson to learn. Yellow cheats are more dangerous than red cheats. With six clearings on the tile, a red cheat has a five out of six chance of summoning monsters to a clearing other than yours. While with a yellow cheat, you are 100% sure to get the monster right on you. Okay, now let's dig a little more into this mechanism. A character ends his turn. For him, this is the end of daylight. He checks if the cheats on his tile do summon new monsters. Note that here, both cheats were already face up because perhaps another character already visited this tile and flipped them already. In the Magic Realm official rules, it is said that you should flip back the cheats face down at the end of each turn, but it is not necessary, I think, and you can let them face up. That's what I do here. The monster roll for this turn is 4, so both Bone C Yellow Cheat and Raw Red Cheat do summon monsters. And first, you can see that there is a Raw entry above the Giants, but with the letter M. M means mountain tiles only. 
our tile is a cave tile, so it doesn't trigger this entry. Still, both bone C and raw C entries are triggered. There are 20 tiles in the game, divided into four groups of five. Valley tiles, wood tiles, cave tiles, and mountain tiles. These categories are quite obvious. As you guess, the dark valley tile, for example, is a valley tile. But I show you them all because some are a little more tricky. The high pass tile is a cave tile in spite of its numerous mountain clearings. And the famous deep wood style is a mountain tile, even if it has no mountain clearing at all. In fact, there is a simple rule. All tiles with four clearings are valley tiles. All tiles with three clearings are wood tiles. The rest is made of six clearing tiles, of which those with at least one underground clearing are cave clearing, and all the remaining ones are mountain clearing, even if there is no mountain on the tile. During the game, there are no cheats on valley tiles. Valley tiles are dwelling tiles. These are safe tiles where you never encounter monsters, but can trade with the local population. On wood tiles, there is one yellow cheat. So there can be monsters there, but no possible treasures. You can hunt in the woods if your goal is to kill monsters, for fame, for example. But if you look for treasures, you'll have to go to six clearing tiles, cave or mountain, where you'll get one yellow cheat, but also one red or orange cheat. And orange cheats, as you know, are treasure locations. So keep this screen in mind when you have to plan your trip through the Magic Realm. That being said, back to our in-game example. End of daylight, our character triggers two cheats, Bone C and Roar on a cave tile, Roar C. When two cheats are triggered, they are resolved from left to right, so Bone C first. There are two monster boxes under the entry. Bones C triggers the first one, two heavy trolls. And because it is a yellow cheat, without a number, the monster spawn on the character's clearing. And then, the red cheat summons the next monster box, the Tremendous Troll. But this time, because there's a number on the red cheat, this monster go to the corresponding clearing, number 4. So, one monster box per cheat, but there can be several monsters in one box, and there can be two boxes if both cheats are triggered. One last example. Here, two characters are ready to enter the cliff tile, the elf and the amazon. This is daylight, and the elf is randomly selected to go first. He ends his turn in the first clearing of the cliff. This is the end of his turn, so he flips the cheats. Bones M and the cairns a treasure location that goes immediately to its clearing, number 5. The monster roll is 4 for this turn, so the yellow cheat summons a monster, the first box under the Bones M entry, and it goes to the clearing where the character triggered it. Yellow cheats are never numbered. No monsters are triggered by the cairns because this location is on the 5th row of the setup card. Then it's still daylight, but it's now the Amazon's turn. She follows her plans and moves to clearing 5, and she is very lucky because she ends on a treasure location. At the end of her turn, she could trigger monsters, but a cheat can summon only one box per daylight, so even if there is still one monster box under the Bones M entry, it won't spawn this turn. And see how the random order for daylight is very important. Should the Amazon start the turn, she would have triggered the giant on her own clearing instead. And note also that because the monster roll is thrown after the end of Birdsong, when writing their plans, players don't know what monsters can be triggered this turn. Even if the cheats are already face up, there is always some uncertainty about what monsters will activate. Now, go on. In this new example, the elf enters the cliff tile in hope to search for the cairns. We don't do the dice rolls here, that's not the point. What we care about is what happens at the end of daylight. Let's say that the monster roll, again, is a 4. The Amazon should trigger monster summoning, but both Tremendous Giants are already on the map from previous turns. 
When a monster spawns on the map, it doesn't go back to the setup card and stays on the map. So because both monster boxes under the bonds M entry are empty, there is no new monster this turn. But that doesn't mean that nothing happens. Just before monster summoning, characters always check if some monsters on their tile are active. A monster is active if its row on the setup card was activated this turn by the monster roll. The Tremendous Giant boxes are on the fourth row, so they are active this turn. And so, at the end of a character's daylight, all Tremendous Giants on her tile move to her clearing. And because monsters know the wilderness like the back of their hand, they don't have to follow the path. Wherever they are, they go straight to their prey. The other giant to the north doesn't move because it is not on the character's tile. And that means that a monster will never go out of his tile. Whenever he moves, that's always toward a clearing from that same tile. Tiles can be seen as their monster's hunting grounds. In this last example, again at Birdsong, the Amazon plans to go to the cliff tile in search for the Cairns treasure location. On sunrise, the monster roll is a 4. Once again, that's incredible. Daylight, the Amazon ends her turn in clearing 5, and it's time to deal with monsters. First, active monsters in the tile move to the character's clearing. But it's not over, because just after moving active monsters, we still check if some new monsters must be summoned from the setup card. And here, look, that's what happens. There's an available monster box under the Bones M entry on the active row, so one more Tremendous Giant, and it goes to the Amazon's clearing because it is triggered by a yellow cheat. We can guess that the evening will be tough for the Amazon, because evening is when battles are fought. We will see soon how to avoid such a deadly situation. Okay, so broadly speaking, monsters do nothing if inactive, that is, if the monster role is not on their row. And on the opposite, when active, they become bloodthirsty and run to your clearing, or they arise from the setup card to your tile. And knowing that, you could think that when the monster role doesn't fit your tile cheats, you are safe and you can freely move, search and loot. Not exactly. For example, let's suppose that on the rune style, a character previously flipped the two cheats and revealed the pool. So, in the midst of the ruins, a frightening black and cold pool is hidden in the depth of some caves. And let's suppose that from this previous turn, the Tremendous Octopus was summoned in the pool. Orange cheats works exactly like red cheats. If the monster roll activates their row, their monster spawns on the number cheats clearing. Now, some turns later, the pilgrim stands in the center of the ruins. He is quite afraid by the octopus and tries to take some bypass route and avoid it. Let's suppose the monster roll is 2. The pilgrim feels relieved because monsters from row 2 fit neither the smoke sea yellow cheat nor the pool orange cheat, and the octopus being from row 3 it will not be active during this turn. So during daylight, the pilgrim does his planned activities. Let's say that he misses his search roll and doesn't find the hidden path. So he cannot walk to clearing 5 and this cancels the rest of his plan. No move, no spawn, the pilgrim is safe. He had one chance in 6 to activate a heavy dragon with a monster roll of 1 and one chance in six also to activate the octopus with a monster roll of three, which would have moved the monster to his clearing, because yes, the octopus can move out of its pool like any monster can move. Okay, but what if, with the same risk, what if the pilgrim did just walk through the octopus? No need to take the long way around, no, just with two moves, he can go to clearing three. But here is what happens. Every time a character enters a monster's clearing, this monster blocks him. And it does so whatever the monster role is. Even if the octopus is inactive this turn, as soon as the pilgrim enters its clearing, it blocks him. More exactly, the blocking happens when a character ends any activity in the same clearing as a monster. 
and the effect of this blocking is that the character's turn immediately stops. All following activities are cancelled, the pilgrim will never reach clearing 3. And so, after daylight, being in the same clearing as a monster during the evening, the pilgrim will have to fight it. Another example. Here, two characters are about to enter the runes, the sorcerer and the magician. The monster role for this turn is 1. Let's say the sorcerer plays first. Daylight. He enters clearing 5. End of his turn, he activates the yellow cheat and spawns a heavy dragon in his clearing, and as soon as the dragon spawns, it blocks the sorcerer. Every time a monster spawns on the same clearing as a character, it blocks this character. But I hear you tell me, what's the point with the monster blocking the character if anyway the sorcerer's turn is over and he will not move anymore? The point is that blocking is always reciprocal. That means that the dragon blocks the sorcerer, but the sorcerer also blocks the dragon. Now, when the magician enters clearing 3 and ends his turn there, the dragon being activated by the monster roll should move to him. But no, because the dragon is blocked by the sorcerer. Thanks to the sorcerer, the magician is safe. Note also that the second monster box under the smoke C entry is not activated because that same yellow cheat already spawned a monster this turn. Now it's next turn and both characters begin this new turn as they ended the previous one. The sorcerer survived this evening with the dragon. We will see later that it is possible to go through a combat against a monster without anyone killing the other. So, the sorcerer begins his turn in the same clearing as the dragon. And because the monster blocks only at the end of any activity, the sorcerer can do one activity before being blocked. He can, for example, leave the tile and be sure that the dragon will not be able to react whatever the monster roll. Beware, here is a funny special case. Let's suppose the next clearing is a mountain clearing. Thus, the sorcerer would have to plan two move activities. But at daylight, the dragon blocks him at the end of his first activity, before he can actually leave the clearing. The blocking cancels his second activity and the sorcerer ends his turn and stays here with the dragon for one more romantic evening. Another example, this time the magician moves first. He moves to clearing 5 and is immediately blocked by the dragon. But the dragon only blocked the magician, so the sorcerer is not blocked. To show that, we put the magician token under the dragon, blocked, and the sorcerer on top of it, non-blocked. When comes the sorcerer's turn, he is free to leave the clearing. And even if the dragon was activated by the monster roll, it doesn't move to the sorcerer because Having blocked the magician, it is itself blocked by the magician. Blocking is always reciprocal. When a monster is summoned and spawns on the map, he immediately blocks all characters in its clearing. Monster roll is 1, the magician moves first. He planned a move to clearing 3 and then he ends his daylight and summons the dragon to his clearing because of the smoke sea yellow cheat. Then, when comes the sorcerer's turn, because the sorcerer is already blocked by the dragon, all his plans are cancelled. He won't do anything this turn. Things would have been very different if the random draw at the beginning of daylight had designated the sorcerer as the first player. In a sense, we saw in this last example how a character can hinder another character's activities He attracts a monster on his clearing and lets the monster do the rest. Okay, but there are more direct ways to do that. A character can simply block another character at the end of any activity. No need of any monster. That's direct player versus player. And on the other way, he can be blocked by the other character as if it were monster. It's the magician turn. He enters the sorcerer's clearing at that time The magician can declare he blocks the sorcerer, cancelling his whole turn, and then if he does not, the sorcerer also can declare he blocks the magician. It works both ways. And because blocking is always reciprocal, both players are blocked and both their turns are over. 
Of course, blocking between players is never mandatory, while a monster always blocks when he can. Well, 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 we don't know yet how monsters fight, but you can guess that it can be dangerous and sometimes, often, you will try to avoid monsters. But what do you do when they stand in your way or when they pop up right there and block you without giving you any chance to flee? Don't worry, there is a solution. You can hide. Hiding is an activity. You must write it in your plan at Birdsong with just the letter H. Then during daylight, for each hide activity, for each letter H, you throw two dice as usual and keep the highest. And then you hide successfully if you get any result but six. In other words, you roll two dice and if one of them is a six, you fail. If you remember the odds, that means that a single hide activity hides you successfully 7 times out of 10. And if you do the math, if you plan two hide activities during the same turn, you succeed 9 times out of 10. On the field, when you successfully hide, you just flip your character token on its green side. Ok, so now you are hidden. What is the difference? The great difference is that when you are hidden, on your green side, monsters don't block you anymore. We are in the deep woods. Some turns ago, unfortunately, the elf came here, revealed the dragon slayer, but thanks to a bad monster roll, the dragon spawned right in his lair and killed the elf. Now, some turns later, our swordsman comes to the deep woods and here is what he does. During birdsong, he writes his plan. Then, at daylight, he moves, he tries to hide, get a result of 5, he successfully hides, then he resumes his moves and when he enters the dragon's lair, the dragon doesn't block him because he is hidden. So he moves again and look, he safely went through the dragon's lair, nothing could be easier. The sourceman could even try to discover the lair with this other plan where he moves, hides, moves to the lair and searches for the treasure location right under the dragon's nostrils who can do nothing because the swordsman is hidden. That seems very convenient, but beware, your hiding attempt can fail. And thus, let's see what happens. The swordsman moves, but with a 6 he fails his hiding roll. He keeps his tan unhidden side, but he doesn't know his camouflage is so bad. As long as you can follow your plans, you must follow your plans. So, the swordsman goes on with his next activity and he enters the dragon slayer. And the dragon spots him and blocks him. He cancels his last activity, he doesn't search and during the evening he will have to fight the dragon. That's why it's often safer to write the hide activity twice in the plan. But that costs you one less activity, one out of four. Safety versus efficiency, tough decision. Next turn, let's suppose our swordsman survived his last evening, but he doesn't want to go through that again. So he plans first a hide activity, then a move out of the lair. But as we will see, it's not a good idea, because if at daylight he misses his hide die roll, at the end of this first activity, he is not hidden and the dragon immediately blocks him and cancels his move. It is far better in this case to start with a move, because a monster can only block you at the end of your first activity. It is enough just not to be in the lair at the end of the first activity. Hiding is not the only way to evade and avoid monsters. Also, hiding does not prevent the activation of monsters. That means that even if your character is hidden, active monsters, those that match the monster role, still spawn or move to your character's clearing. For example, the monster role is 3 and the dwarf moves to the maple woods and hides. At the end of his daylight, he flips his tile sheet face up and he spawns a monster box full of 6 wolves. But because he is hidden, the dwarf is safe. He is not blocked and he won't have to fight during the evening. But now it's the Berserker's turn, who after some work on neighboring tiles, ends his daylight hidden in Maplewood's clearing 2. 
He is hidden, but still, he triggers active monsters. So, the wolf's pack moved to his clearing. Because the wolves didn't block the hidden dwarf, the dwarf didn't block them in return. So, they are still free to move, and they move to the berserker. But now, let's imagine instead that the dwarf wanted to hunt the wolves. The dwarf chose fame as his victory conditions, and is looking to kill monsters. He doesn't want to see them go out of his clearing. So when the dwarf ends his delight, hidden, and when the wolves spawn on his clearing, he can decide to block them. The wolves first don't block the dwarf because he's hidden. But the dwarf declares he wants to block the wolves. When you block someone or something, you become unhidden. So the dwarf loses his camouflage, and now when the berserker arrives on the tile, whether hidden or not, the wolves don't move to him, because they are blocked by the dwarf. Ok, you understand how hiding works and what benefits you can get from it. But, once you are hidden, how long does it last? How long do you stay out of monster's view? Simple, you stay hidden until your next daylight. And it is very important to understand that it doesn't last until next daylight, but until your next daylight. For example, we are on the ledges. Monster roll is 2. And during her daylight, the witch moves to clearing 1 and hides. Let's assume she passes her hiding dice roll. And now her turn is over. Next turn, she plans to go on her way. And this turn's monster roll is 5. This is now daylight, but the witch doesn't lose her hidden status now. She stays hidden until her own daylight. And it happens that random selection designates the woods girl as the first character for this turn. And the woods girl plays roughly the same as the witch the turn before. But here, because the monster roll is 5, a huge spider goes out of its dank tunnel. And look, because the witch is still hidden from previous turn, she is not blocked by the spider. And now when it is the witch turn, the witch daylight, she becomes unhidden again, But she is not blocked by the spider until the end of her first activity. So she moves to clearing 4 and she is safe. No worries. Ok, now that you know how to hide, you feel well suited against monsters, ready to fight, but also ready to flee when needed. But sometimes your enemies are not monsters, but other characters. Sometimes you don't want to flee, but you want to track down other players and get them killed. And what can you do if themselves are hiding from you? This is the Bad Valley and the magician is hiding in some bushes on the side of the road. But here comes the Black Knight, a character killer, looking for him. Here are his plans. Let's go and see what happens. The Black Knight moves, and then it's time to search. And the Black Knight chooses a new search table, the Peer Table. As usual, he chooses which table he rolls on at the moment he must execute his search order. And if he gets a hidden enemy's result on a roll of 3 or 4, or even on a roll of 1 which give him the choice, he finds hidden enemies. And that means that until the end of the turn, after all activities, after all battles, that is until midnight, he sees hidden characters as if they were unhidden. So here, let's say that the Black Knight rolled a 4. He finds hidden enemies. And especially, he sees these hidden enemies, the Magician. So, because this is the end of his activity, he can block him. Being blocked, the Magician loses his hidden status. Now everyone can see him, and if monsters spawn or move to his clearing, they will also block and attack the magician. And because it works until midnight, even if later during the turn another hidden character tries to move through his clearing, the Black Knight can still block him and make him unhidden also. Ok, this peer search table allows some other results. If you get a clues result, You can peek at the face-down cheats on your tile without revealing them. We already knew this result from the locate table. You can also find paths. Paths are like secret passages, but paths are brown, while secret passages are black. 
You can see hidden paths as camouflage track under the trees, while secret passages are tunnels dug under the ground. On the player personal sheets, there are two separate entries for paths and secret passages. So, depending on what you are looking for, up to you to choose the search table that fits your goals. But, on top of that, the peer search table has something very special. If you are on a mountain clearing, not a mountain tile, but especially a mountain clearing, you can use the peer table to search on adjacent tiles with your spyglass from the top of the mountain. And this time, you cannot wait until daylight to choose where you search. You must write at birdsong in your plans where exactly you will peer. And because you can find hidden path with this search, it can be a good idea to choose a clearing a hidden path leads from or to. At daylight, the black knight rolls on the peer table and finds this hidden path on a roll of one, two or three on the adjacent tile. That's the power of the peer table. If he gets the result clues, he can peek at the adjacent sheets on the tile he were looking at. And thus, it's a very good way to look for the best treasure locations without having to actually move to all these tiles. Okay, and so you know how to use the search activity at its best. Locate, mainly to find treasure locations and secret passages, but also clues. Peer, to find hidden enemies and hidden paths, clues also, and especially on adjacent tiles if you are in a mountain clearing. Loot, to get treasures from treasure location previously discovered with a search activity on the locate table. And voila! A last thing before wrapping up this video. Over time, day by day, as you explore the magical kingdom, monsters will appear here and there. With character activities, monsters will move, and with combat, some monsters will be killed. And that can be a great opportunity for characters. For example, here on day 6, the Amazon can safely enter and explore the cliff tile because its sheets are Stink M and Patter, and looking at the setup card, the Amazon knows that there is no available monsters anymore for these two sheets. And as a skillful adventurer of the Magic Realm, you should always keep an eye on the setup card and make your plans accordingly. But here comes the seventh day. Every time this is the last day of a week, that is day 7, 14, 21 and 28, at sunrise, players throw the monster roll as usual, but then immediately there is a monster's regeneration. Regeneration means that any monster in the setup card's row, matching the monster roll, goes back immediately to the setup card, whether this monster is dead or if it is still on the map. Wherever it is, the monsters go back to the setup card and so, at the end of the regeneration, the row matching the monster roll will be full just like at the beginning of the game. In the following daylight phase, the monster roll stays the same and the corresponding monsters can spawn to the map again. So beware, don't forget that every 7 days, regeneration brings some fresh air to the monster agenda. And that's it for this video. You know how monsters act and react to the adventurer's activities. And now, if we want to keep it logical, our next step is to learn how to fight them because we didn't come in the magic realm to hide, run and flee, did we? I'm sure you want to know if you are fit for combat. This will be the topic of my next video.